Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Bunn with iSelect Fund. I'm pleased to welcome you to Agri-Food Conversations, brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is Tom Bunn again. Uh, I'm an associate with iSelect Fund, and it's good to be here with you this afternoon. As many of you know, Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in food and ag. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, and for this month, the month of June, we are focusing on ag finance. And today we're joined by iSelect portfolio company, TradeLance. We have VJ Harrell, the CEO and founder of TradeLance with us. TradeLance is TradeLance global trade management platform allows shippers to digitize and automate their supply chains, leveraging an easy to use web interface to access real-time data about shipments, destinations, and clients. The company is bringing ag shippers, merchants, and buyers together with tools that offer advanced tracking, digital documentation, vendor collaboration, detailed reporting, and more to simplify the process of going global. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in TradeLine's market. Your potential customers for their products and services, you've built a similar company, or you were a sophisticated business person or ag professional who understands their market and the challenges and opportunities that they may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call. Please take a few seconds to answer. Additionally, a few process comments while the poll is running. We are not soliciting investment in any way whatsoever. This presentation is to provide information to help trade lanes find customers, mentors, or other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. Secondly, you are all on mute. However, you can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. We will have a dedicated Q&A portion of the call during which you can either raise your hand and we can unmute you to ask a question to VJ directly, or you can type up a question into the Q&A pane and I will read it to VJ. Finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce VJ Harrell, the CEO of TradeLines. VJ, take it away. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining and uh, allowing us to share with you what we're up to. At TradeLines, we're building the global digital infrastructure for commodity trade. In essence, reinventing logistics, insurance, and finance for global commodity trade, a new way businesses trade one document at a time. Before we get into it, I'm going to define a term that everyone in the industry knows well, but if you go and look it up, there isn't sort of a Google search or a dictionary term for it, and that's trade execution. And in short, trade execution is everything you need to fulfill your contractual obligation to your buyers in order to get paid. As everyone knows, global trade is a massive and complex industry. At the center of it is our set of documents. They control all the things. That first document is the contract between buyer and seller. Global trade is relying on this documentation. It drives every step of the process. And as documents control that process and it starts between buyer and seller, that ultimately is the most important relationship that drives everything else in global trade. That's where we are focused. Now, existing tools for global trade are designed for a world that no longer exists. Starting in 2015, there is trade disruption every year since, from the California port shutdowns to Hanjin collapse to trade wars and, and then COVID. These systems were designed for just in time. They're siloed, manual processes, and they produce error prone documents. So this is the old way. This old way costs exporters over $300 billion a year globally. And the complexity and scale of trade documentation requires a new way. Underpinning our reason for being is that we are turning, the industry sees the, the documents as costs. We are turning documents into currency because documents determine everything. Title of goods, who owns them, if they're going to clear customs, how they're going to be moved, and when payment can be collected. And so we've built trade lanes, we designed it for this new era of trade for agility and resiliency. And I think everyone 
uh, who has experienced container Armageddon for the last year, it's still kind of going on, understands why that's important. Uh, unified systems, collaborative processes, and digital documents connect the financial supply chain and the physical supply chain. More specifically, what we're driving is an Amazon-like customer experience with seamless trade execution. So everything from contract to presentation of documents to collecting payment is done in one place, full transparency, full visibility, and a user-friendly workflow. In addition to this new era of trade, constant disruption, teams were already realizing that automation was a big thing. COVID accelerated that. And just about a month ago, the G7 countries in the European Union adopted a framework for electronic transferable records. Why is that important? Well, for, for our growth, we've been leveraging digital documents on the payment side because every country has its own laws around digital documents, digital signatures, notarized documents. While with this, with adoption of this framework, there's a government mandate for these countries and that will continue to expand. Basically exporters have 12 to 18 months to prepare. This is actually a big, big deal for industry worldwide. And the new, unique things about trade lanes is that we're built on this framework. We're built on this global uh, standard. So who is trade lanes? Well, just a quick overview. We've got offices in four continents, a, a deeply experienced management team. We're well capitalized with some of the best investors, including iSelect. And we're grow we've got rapid growth year over year. Our world-class team and advisors hails from deep experience in technology, supply chain, and logistics. Additionally, we've got experience from some of the top industry names in terms of like Gartner and new innovative companies in logistics like Shipwell. And we surrounded ourselves with world-class advisors from Cargill, Intertech, StoneX, and CoBank. Our investors are the best of the best in breed. I'll say no more. <laughs> They're a big part of the reason why we're able to achieve the things that we are today. We've made a significant impact on the industry. Our customers are top 10 US exporters based off of, our customers in the US are top 10 US exporters based on the Journal of Commerce publication of the top 100 US exporters by container volume. Two of them are in the top 15 and we were able to expand geographically with our core focus being in the US. Because of that success, word's gotten out and we were been able to expand geographically. I think something really important to note is that Gartner ranks two organizations in the top quadrant for transportation and logistics. That's Oracle and SAP. And mo most recently, our, one of our newest customers had is ripping out Oracle transportation management to replace it with trade lanes. One of the benefits of what we're doing is not just that we're doing it in a unique way and we're doing it with some of the best, best commodity firms in the market is that when you tap into our network, when you leverage our platform, you get access to a much larger network, thousands of buyers and suppliers, hundreds of storage location and transportation providers. I'm going to go high level on how it works. This is not going to be a product demo, but just some details around what makes us unique, how that adds value to exporters. At the underpinning of our platform is shortening the trade to cash cycle uh, with automation. Starting with a set of rules, there's a set of global trade rules that everyone has to follow and everyone's familiar with these payment terms, INCO terms. Well, those rules are codified into our platform from end to end, meaning we, every step of the process, it knows what the delivery risk and costs are for both the exporter and the, sorry, the seller and the buyer and what they need to do at each step in order to transfer those risks and those costs. You can transact with any kind of party, no integration needed. Specific outcomes just on the trade execution side of our platform is faster document turnaround times, which means you can get paid faster. And each day that you lower 
you remove from your day sales outstanding allows you to turn around sales or inventory faster, meaning you can grow your sales with the same working capital. What we've noticed and in our experience is that there's generally a conflict between when the seller wants to get paid and when the buyer wants to make payment. We see this less of a conflict, but there's a win-win model where you can enable more trade. And the way to do that is to combine execution with insurance and trade finance. When you do that, the benefits for exporters are a reduction in day sales outstanding, which can lead to significant numbers and growth in sales with the same working capital, in addition to lowering the finance costs as a percentage of your landed costs. That's trade lanes. We're reinventing logistics, insurance, and finance for global commodity trade, one document at a time. We are the new way that businesses trade. That's the end of uh, the presentation. I'll open it up for questions. Awesome, DJ. Thanks so much for walking us through what you're what you're up to. Exciting times for the company. I guess you know one of the places I like to start is you're obviously tackling a huge problem and varying angles on it. What's what do you see as the biggest risk? What's keeping you up at night? Apart from the fact that you're getting married in a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the CEO at home has me, has, has my, my tasks laid out for me. Definitely exciting times on the wedding front. For, but from a business perspective, things that keep us up at night are what, what concerns our customers and the industry as a whole. Number one, since COVID, not only has digitization accelerated, but the problems, the disruption and the space and, and moving containers across the world has increased. There's not enough equipment. So having that visibility, collecting that the correct data on time so that teams can manage those exceptions. More the more data we collect, the better our, our customers can can make sure that they're delivering to their customers on time and or being able to sidestep landmines before they occur. So having that flexibility, having that agility, having that resiliency, those are the things that keep us up ultimately because that's what we exist to solve those problems. I, yeah, I think those that's, and so on that front, we are, we've been a number of internal initiatives to continue to double down on our platform. I select and our, and our other investors have doubled down on their commitment to us, which allowed us to raise a significant round of funding last year during COVID to accelerate those opportunities. And as we do that, we're seeing that we can solve more problems for existing customers, but it's, it's attracting more more companies to trade lanes, having that conversation. And we're showing, we're able to show more companies, how we can help them drive, shorten their trade to cash cycle, which ultimately helps them drive their business. I think the other part of that is just being able to get, to provide this to more, to more companies. As a startup, we have certain, we can't boil the ocean. And, but as we grow, we're able to expand that serviceable market, which means we can all, we're lucky to have these very big companies that work with us, but now we're able to expand our platform and make it accessible to the midsize and even uh, smaller companies, which enables more trade, helps teams hire more people, then ultimately increases the standard of living in their local communities. Terrific. Thank you. Well, I forgot to mention to the uh, attendees, now is a great time to post the questions to VJ. It looks like some of you already have done so. Again, the best way to do so is either to type a question into the Q&A box that, you see, that you'll see on the bottom of your Zoom app, or to raise your hand on the right side of the app, and I will unmute you to ask a question directly. But it looks like we've had a couple come in. The American Society of Agricultural Consultants asks partially a SWOT analysis, what are the possible weaknesses and threats of this digital implementation of trade transactions? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think it really boils down to kind of two pieces at, at a top level. One, the physical supply chain and two, the financial supply chain. Given that the, phys- the financial supply chain has more leeway, meaning there's no government regulations around digital documents for payments that's governed by the banks, that while that's a risk, more banks are moving and you know, what things we saw that happened in COVID is bank, bank branches may have had to shut down. And so getting a packet of documents would slow down like because it would arrive at the office and people weren't in the office, it would slow down that cycle time. So we're definitely seeing, and this has been happening for some time, but it accelerated during COVID, banks moved to more digital stuff. So on the financial supply chain, we're seeing that amplify. I think the other risk, and this is a bit of a bigger risk, is on the physical supply chain. Whenever you clear customs and the destination uh, country, um, every country has their own set of laws and regulations around digital documents, digital signatures, and notarized documents, all things that are important for trade transactions. Some countries are a little bit more advanced than others. And that helps, but, and it's been moving forward. Things have been evolving at, a, at a, in an increased pace, but I think, and that's been sort of the biggest risk to complete digitization today. And there's two reasons for that. One, because of these laws and regulations. And I think with the G7 agreement, we're gonna see that expand to G20 and ultimately all the countries in WTO. And then I think then the, the next step there is it's not just the buyer and seller who need to be aware of this and be able to leverage technology to do it. But when you're clearing customs, those government agencies need to be aware of handling that. The drayage provider that's coming in or the freight forwarder who's coming in to, to clear those goods at the destination need to be aware of how to handle digital documents. So that's definitely uh, a, a weakness in the supply chain, but given the explosion in technology and digitization, the supply chain, uh, we suspect the ecosystem is rich enough to make sure that over the coming you know, 12 to 18 months, those things are gonna be in place to, to manage those. Uh, I, more specifically, I think there's been a lot of different agreements with APEC and TTIP, things like that, that drive more digitization to, tr- to facilitate trade. So definitely a weakness and a threat, but there's, there's a lot, there's a rich ecosystem that's going to be able to leverage technology that not only exporters and importers will be able to tap into, but we'll be able to tap into as well with our, with our platform, given that it's API driven. Anonymous attendee asks, does your platform leverage blockchain technology? Great question. So I'm gonna start with a couple of statements around blockchain. Blockchain is a, is a, while a novel technology is also a nascent technology. Even though it's been around for over 10 years, still a lot of figuring out how to leverage it in certain places. It's being, that value is being uh, realized in some places and still has a lot of work in others. And I think for it to be ubiquitous, I think what we need to see is sort of what Cisco did for the internet. Their routers and their switches really helped make the internet accessible to everyone. And there will be a Cisco of blockchain, but there isn't one today. And uh, maybe they're early, maybe they're just doing some work in, a, in an adjacent space, but that's coming. So understanding that that's coming, we built our technology using the same, we built our platform leveraging the same technology as blockchain, which means we can plug and play when the time is right. But today we're able to uh, facilitate what we call intelligent smart contracts, or sorry, intelligent contracts without, without needing to leverage blockchain. Great, thanks, BJ. Another anonymous attendee asks, what's your top traded commodity? 
today would be grains, grain and feed. And we're seeing a lot of growth in meat, dairy, produce. And we're actually getting a lot of interest on some of the other, some of the less soft commodities like recyclables and plastics. Thank you very much. Uh, specifically, plastics and recyclables are really interesting to us as it relates to the circular economy. But more specifically, I think, and we're seeing this more often, is where ESG is a big corporate initiative and there's carbon offsets, which there's some open source tools that we can plug into to calculate that. We do that as part of, as part of our internal reporting. But more specifically, we're actually seeing some interesting trends where those carbon offsets can be used to lower your cost. So as we start to tap, as we start to, the reason I bring all that up is because as we start to see interest, as we continue to move into the circular economy around recyclables, whether that's plastic recyclables, paper recyclables, et cetera, or even electronics for that matter, and or those virgin materials, there's, there's a really interesting benefit, not just to our customers and our platform, but I think to the industry as a whole. And we specifically focus on commodities because any physical product in this, in the world can be made of material source one of three ways. Either you fish it from the sea, mine it from the earth or grow it on a farm. From there you can create every product around us, including the laptop and or uh, device that we're all uh, listening to participating in this webinar. What about top ports? So A to B shipping, what's, what are, what are those most um, frequently used routes? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's, I'll say, I, I won't go into specific ports because it's, it's the way that we think about it is origin destination pairs. Ultimately, that is one of the key drivers to success in supply chain and, and, and commodity trade is understanding the requirements for moving something from an origin country to a destination country. I would say in, in given where, and this is just, this is, given where we focus in our top traded commodities, I think it's, I think industry experts would assume that our largest origin destination pairs would be US to Asia, and that would be correct. As we continue to grow in other verticals, we're starting to see more, more lanes, if you will, ultimately more trade lanes. So US to Africa, US to Europe, US to South America. Our focus is US, but we're also, given our expansion, we're seeing, you know, we're, we, we have customers in Australia originating out of Africa, originating out of the EU, originating out of South America. So we're seeing lots of new trade flows as we continue to grow, but today predominantly US and Asia. Fantastic. Well, while potential Final questions are trickling in, BJ. I always like to end it on on how can this network here live and those listening retroactively help you, and how can they get in contact with you? Yeah, to get in contact, you can always go to our website or you can email us uh, at hello at tradelanes.co. That's probably the easiest way. In terms of ways to help, look, we we we're we're going through a really strong period of growth and we want to be able to support, like we're, that growth is allowing us to support firms of all sizes. While we focus on mid-market, we've been able to actually go up market. What's really important for us is being able to support smaller merchants, smaller exporters. And so if, if anyone, who is engaged in trade, any firm that's engaged in trade knows that documents is ultimately the currency with which they get paid. 
and we can help any of those companies do it a better way that helps them grow their business. So if you know any, any exporters, feel free to send them our way. We'd love to talk to them and show them ways, provide the insights that we have from our platform to help them grow their business. Great. Well, VJ, thanks so much for joining us. We uh, appreciate you taking the time and congratulations on all the progress. And to those in attendance, thanks for joining us. As a reminder, we host these calls every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. Again, this month's theme is ag finance. <clears throat> so we will have a uh, notification about next week's presenter probably tomorrow or early next week. And if you know anybody who might want to hear this presentation by VJ, please do direct them to agrifoodconversations.com. A replay will be emailed to you and feel free to forward that on for the chance for uh, other folks to register. So hope everyone has a great uh, rest of their afternoon and uh, hopefully we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks again all. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everyone.